Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Pixel Feed Radio. I'm here with my friend Ali Debachi. Ali, how you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Thanks for having me. No, uh, of course, of course. I'm actually so excited about this episode. Uh, for those of you don't, that don't know, Ali, um, he's the founder and CEO of a company called Realware, where they specialize scaling e-commerce businesses. But we're not talking about the type of business that you and I deal with. I haven't gotten to that level yet. This is a, we're talking about Fortune 50 companies, like the, <laughs> the, the cream of the crop. So I'm so excited to talk about this because I'm sure there's strategies that are going to go way over my head and I, and I want to learn some of it and definitely hear your story because I mean, everybody starts somewhere and to build it to where you're at today, I'm sure there's a great story behind it. Um, and then we'll get into the whole SaaS side of things and all that good stuff. But uh, Ali, let's get started, man. So how did you become an entrepreneur? How did you start, you know, when you were a kid? Were you one of those kids like trying to sell different things, build things? How did it all start? Yeah, for me, it started uh, really early. I, I was lucky enough to be able to have a Radio Shack nearby, and I started getting, uh, I'm a propeller head at heart. At the end of the day, I'm an engineer. but um, So I started d diving into all kinds of technical elements, and, and then, uh, you know, I went to school for, for medical, um, went for a couple of years and decided, yeah, that's not for me. And I figured out that uh, <laughs> technology and computers are where it's at, and I right. started my first company, uh, left college and started my first company um, in uh, the late 80s. Um, and so from there, it's just been a wonderful, successful, lucky life. Uh, all of the, I think the biggest success factor is always being focused on the customer. We've all, I've always been 100% focused on what value do we deliver? Are we really doing it? Are we doing a great job? Are we putting users back in control? Are we giving them what they want? Um, and then backing into what do we need in order to keep doing that for a very long time. Yeah, uh, I always so said if you're starting, if you're not losing sleep over certain clients and over certain things that you're not passionate about what you do, because I mean, that's, that's number one thing, right? You gotta, you gotta care about your clients and listen, let's face it, especially when you're starting out in some of these smaller clients, you know, they can be a headache and big clients can be a headache too, but you know, it's all part of the game and it's, it's about bringing uh, you know, the most value that you can to them. So you can grow, you can, you can grow your company, you can help them grow because I mean, for me, that's the, the best feeling that you can get when you help, you know, your client grow to the next level with the help that you're providing to them with the services that you're providing to them. So it's, it's so familiar to the story. I actually, I dropped out my second year of, uh, of college. I was like, this is not for me. I just want to go make money. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, and, and you were a doctor, you were a lot farther than I was. I was like dipping into the whole business side of things and computer science, but I was like, yeah, calculus, calculus and I don't get along. This is not going to happen. <laughs> you know, my friend didn't take it that far. So you left college and, and where, where did we go from there? This is the eighties too. So you're, yeah, so uh, this is late eighties. So I started a company that was doing uh, hardware design. We built uh, customized uh, PC builds basically. And we focused on the fed and uh, education markets. And we were the only option, we were the only option to companies like IBM, HP, and Dell. We grew very quickly and, and then I sold that company. And then from there, I started an internet company, again, focused on the users and building um, options for them. Um, we were the largest privately held uh, ISP in Southern New York. And we, I sold that to a roll up that was a cable company. And then I started Realware in 1999, really with the objective of focusing on smaller businesses, because when I started my company, I didn't have a huge budget. Nobody wanted to talk to me, right? It, I'm a bootstrapper, right? I prefer to not go out and raise money because I don't want to be beholden to anyone. I want to do what's right uh, for the customer, regardless of sometimes profit motive, right? Sometimes you're doing the right thing is a long-term play, not a short-term gain. So um, Realware was started to, to, to provide my point of view and my consulting to smaller people, smaller companies that would not have that ability to get someone with experience and capabilities and, uh, and to their to their front door even. Uh, and it's grown, frankly. Um, in the beginning, we, we were just consulting and then we moved into data centers. We started building data centers. Um, and then we started um, uh, developing platforms. Um, and so now we do the entire thing. We do everything from strategy to deployment. And uh, of course we're using cloud, right? Like that's the marketing term everyone wants to use. So we're using cloud infrastructure for all of those things. Um, but we're building tools that don't take agility away from um, our customers. In other words, we're not a drag on their business. A lot of other business models, the bigger you get, the more you pay. 
um, or they're always taking a piece of your action, right? All the time taking a piece, That's half of my piece, tools. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so our products aren't built that way. We're built on scale. So what we do is we build tools that as your revenue grows like this, our cost grows like that. It stays pretty flat because we're not tying our cost basis to your revenue number. We're, we're actually just in, in empowering you to grow that way. So yeah, for the longest time. Yeah, for the longest time, um, you know, uh, I'm a kid of the 80s. So I had like my first computer was I was lucky enough that my dad got an Apple II. So I've been through the whole computer. I build my own still to this day. And, you know, there was a point there where all of a sudden everybody just woke up one day and said, you know what? Let's just charge monthly for everything. Like <laughs> people will pay it, you know? And uh, the funny uh, joke that I have between all my friends and I, because, you know, we joke about it all the time. It's like I, I did not upgrade Photoshop for I don't even know how many years because I refuse to pay a monthly fee for it because I don't use it that much. And then one day it's like, all right, I give in, I have to. <laughs> so I did it and I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm happy, it's justified. Now I use it more than ever because they kept adding so much cool stuff to it, right? So it makes sense. But I also see the other side of things where it's like, I'm just paying you monthly because I have to, there's no upgrades, right. there's no value offer, you know, but, and they know that you can do that. So I think it's like a, I like that you're going the other way while providing value while these companies grow. So man, that, there's so many questions. So when, when you get a company, like, uh, I brought this up, uh, um, one of the companies you work with, Aina, who does, uh, healthcare, how did, how does the process even start? Like, I can't even imagine like how to, you know, obviously there's an audit. I mean, there's a million meetings of what needs to be implemented, but, and you don't have to use their, their specific example because I'm sure there's right. NDAs and stuff like that. But when a company that big approaches realware, what is the process like to figure out, you know, not what's wrong, but what's needed and to implement it and the rollout, how long does that take? And, and how do you guys know which way to take it? Um, so it's a great question for a bigger because really it's kind of the same approach with smaller companies as well. It really gets to what is the outcome that you're trying to, to, to deliver? Where are you going? What are you trying to do? Who is the customer? What is, what are they doing? How are they engaging with you? I think one of the interesting things that we take, um, a different approach, we don't go straight, be, you know, a lot of people think because we're a technical company, we're going to go straight to the bits and the bytes, the speeds and the feeds, the features and requirements. No, we start with the business side. We want to map the business as, as fully as we can. We want to understand exactly why did you call us? Um, you know, we're not McKinsey. We're not Ernst & Young. You know, we are very good at what we do. And we're, we're, um, uh, we have a very high success rate. And, and being in business for 20 years, we have customers that have been with us for 10, 15 years. So, you know, we're doing a good job. But in the end of the day, um, why did you call us? What was the motivation or the pain that got you to pick up the phone and call someone you knew that knew us and and reach out. Once we understand that clearly, you know, where is the problem? Is it internal? Is it external? Is it a combination of both? You know, then we can start mapping how we would approach resolving the issue, right? It's never a, it's never a silver bullet. That's one thing I want everybody to understand is it doesn't matter again, if you're a big company or a small company, there is not one thing that solves every problem. There is not one thing that you can apply in every situation. We just have experience in a lot of different areas. Um, you know, having been a bootstrap and an entrepreneur start startup multiple times successfully, having built and raised funds, having been a CXO of large organizations, um, both public and private, we bring a lot of experience. You know, the 50 people we have, they have a broad experience set across all types of technologies, all types of businesses, all types of verticals. So the idea is first to define what that outcome is. And then we align everything to those outcomes you know, whatever they might be. So let's say, for example, the objective is we want to provide our, our customers with, make it, make it easier for them to work with us, right? You know, most companies put up a website in the beginning, right? It was just a brochure site. It was just there because it was just another version of the yellow pages. But now with Omnichannel, you have to be everywhere. You have to, you, well, I should, let me pause this. You have to be everywhere if your customers are everywhere. So you have to be everywhere your customers are. If they want to text, you have to text. If they want to email, you have to email. If they want to call you, you still have to answer the phone, right? If they want to be on yes. WhatsApp or Instagram or Pinterest, you have to be able to manage all of that. And so what we do is we look at all of those things. We analyze who your customers are. And then we put a plan together that addresses the customers first. How do we make it easy for them to engage with you? And then how do we make it easy for you to deliver? That's the two sides of the, equa of the equation, right? And then we solve for that. And, and we solve for that 
by with the platforms we have. We have a lot of intellectual property that we've built over the 20 years that addresses everything from the warehouse all the way to CRM, order management, e-com, et cetera. So we can build a unified solution that has one mission, and that is to make your life easier delivering while you make your customer's life easier, which is very different than cobbling together a whole bunch of SaaS products, trying to make them work together, and then having an army of people just to make sure that doesn't fall down. So, so I was... Sorry. So, uh, no, I was going to say, I always wonder about that. Like, you know, when I grew up working for like, you know, in, in high school and a little bit in college, um, you know, at one point I worked for um, at and I was like 19 or whatever. And I was wondering like, who creates the software that they use you know, for it? Because it's for them. No one else has utility for that software. Right. So it's, it's companies like Realware that come in. And it's like, all right, we got to create a software that does X, X and X. And we're not talking about, I mean, you know, Again, this is like the '90s, like when cell phones were becoming like popular. But uh, you know, uh, the software had to keep track of the activations of each phone. The the what is it called? The serial number, the the, the SIM the card, IMEI, right? Yeah, all that stuff, and then put it together. You know, tell the system that this is this client's on now on this plan. I can't even imagine what the process is like to try to figure out how to come up, develop that software. I mean, when you come in. With a company like that, what is that process like? Is I mean, do you? I don't even know how you even get started. Do you create like a flow chart and then just start building oh, from yeah, there? Oh yeah, yeah. So once you get to, definitely, so you you start with a business map, which is basically you know a bunch of it depends on the type of business, but it could be you know simply a bunch of racetrack drawings that say here's who we are and here's who what the systems are that touch those. Again, always re relating. I think the key is it doesn't matter what the artifact is and how you represent it, so that people can read it and say yes, that's what I want. It's more important that it aligns with what the outcomes are because you can write all the flow charts and the requirements you want. You can I've seen places come out with a you know with a set of documents that you know were this thick. And you go through that and you're like, so how does this help you? <laughs> you know, where, <laughs> how does this make does, my life easier? How does this make your life easier? Right, exactly. And so yes, we do flow charts, we do requirements sessions, we 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 approach everything from an iterative perspective. We don't believe in the big bang waterfall approach we want to really get in there and have some easy wins like if we can identify you know for example if i go to a into a company and this happens a lot we get a lot of calls from companies that are failing um and they they give us a whole bunch of things our pnl isn't great our our uh, our conversions are down blah 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 and so they think we're going to dive into the technology and that's not where we go we go to customer service like i'll go sit with the customer service people and say tell me what your calls are like tell me what people are saying and you'll invariably find out that there's other issues, you know, shipped, something got shipped wrong, misshipped, bad packing, you know, they, it was late, it was bad communication, it had nothing to do with the product, it had nothing to do with, you know, the website, it had, it had to do with execution. And that's where we start to dig in with the easy wins, and I'll go sit with the warehouse manager, or we'll go sit with, you know, the product design, we'll go sit with packaging, we'll go sit with it and we'll decide, okay, guys, here's what we're hearing from the customers. Let's fix these little things first so we can at least get some traction with them and start building trust again. It's really important, right, to make those little wins. Get the little wins before you go for the big, big thing. Um, and that's how I approach whether you're one person trying to start a business or you're 50,000 people trying to change a specific process. The, uh, the important thing is to gain confidence, and you gain confidence by building trust, and you gain trust by building little steps one at a time. I call it one degree of change. If you just improve one degree today, and you draw that line out for a year, you're going to see a massive amount of improvement nine months down the road because one degree change, a deflection here is a huge change down the road. Yeah, I tell so, people, sorry, I tell people all the time that, listen, it, the, you know, ads is only part of one part of the traffic. It's only one part of the equation. You know, if you can improve that conversion rate on your site by literally 0.3 it equals X amount of sales, you know, depending on the company. And they're like, oh my God, I'm like, yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, it's exactly. like, this is stuff we got to yeah, look exactly. at. And the other thing that a good point that you brought up, and again, this is TV, but I'm sure people who are watching this or listening to this, they've seen shows like The Prophet or I don't know, uh, I can't even think of, there's many others, but right. that's exactly what what The, the Prophet, uh, Marcos Lamont, that's exactly what he does. He goes in there, sits down with everyone. It's like, tell me what it's like. What are people That's complaining right. about? And, That's right. <laughs> and it's like, it's amazing to me how disconnected some of these uh, CEOs or founders are, oh, yeah. you know, because I deal with it too all the time. Like, well, when was the last time you said, you know, a customer service for a day just to see it? When was the last time you looked at all your customer service inbox? Like, it, or I'm amazed to this day that there's, you know, I've dealt with businesses that make millions of dollars a year 
and the CEO doesn't know their numbers. And I'm just like, how do you, how, how is this even successful? Like, you don't know your LTV, you don't know your AOV or your lifetime. I mean, it just blows my mind. And that's like, that's right. One of the most important things you got to know, because how are you going to improve a business if you're not in the trenches trying to figure out what's wrong in the first place? Absolutely. I agree with you 100 percent. I mean, just remember, a lot of CEOs weren't CEOs three, four years ago or five years ago. They were just someone with an idea. And through force of will, they 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 were successful, which is great for them. And I think one of the things that you get to when you get to a certain point where you're doing three, four, five million, six million, ten million, 10 million, even you think you have got it all figured out yeah. because you're successful. <laughs> And, and I really think those folks, you know, they could really benefit from coaching and mentoring from people who have done other things to figure out how they can build a stronger team. Because once you get to those numbers, 1 million, then 5 million, then 10 million, the next inflection point is 20 million, then 50 million. And to get from one to five is much easier than getting from 10 to 20. Yeah, right? that point because is. Now you have to build a huge team. You've got to start trusting people as an entrepreneur. It's not all about you anymore. You know, it's about cultivating the team and making sure that everybody understands what they're doing. What we do here, by the way, is any new hire, it doesn't matter what department, they have to work in operations for six months. I love it. And so they have to suffer. Like if they have to, I mean, they have to hear the customers, you know, and what they're dealing with and what they're, what they're help and what they need help with. And because you can't do this job, or frankly, you can't truly say you're customer focused if you don't know the customer, if you don't know their pain. And unless you come from the customers, you know, inside a cl particular client, you don't know their pain until you work in operations. <laughs> yeah, no, you, absolutely. You got to know what's wrong, I mean, especially right. if you're doing, you know, products, um, exactly. you know, service of a products, you got to, you know, something's wrong with your product. This is how you improve it. You know, people ask me all the time. It's like, oh, how do I improve my product? Like, I, I don't know where to go into, blah, blah. I'm like, go to Amazon, man. Just Google the same type of product on Amazon and go read every single review. And I t I'm telling you, after you read hundreds of reviews, just write down the ones that keep coming because you're going to see a pattern. People are going to complain about the same thing over and over and over again. And once you figure that out, that's how you tweak your product and brand it your way and then make it better and sell something like it or whatever it helps the idea that you're coming up with. But you got to know what's wrong with it before you can fix it. Absolutely. And, and many, I've seen it too, where there's like a dis, a, di, there's a disconnect between teams. So one team is trying to fix something that the other team doesn't know about or and then the other team gets in the way because they're the ones that actually deal with it <laughs> you know so how do you guys how do you guys deal with that when you're trying to set up these systems and processes to make sure it's a, like a smooth uh flow of uh, processes because like you said from 10 to 20 to 50 i mean it's all about systems and processes at that point yeah so how do you team a doing so focused on problem x and you have team b pro focused on problem y and they're not trying to solve the same, they're not solving for the same issues. That's the biggest problem is they, they, they take their own problem as the one that is the biggest issue. And really what you need to do there is there's an impedance mismatch between those two communicating, that's number one. So they might be talking to each other, but they're not communicating, there's a difference because they don't have a common language. They don't understand what the other one, so you might, one might be a tech group, one might be a products group or a marketing group. And one is, speak, is, talking, is speaking marketing and the other one is speaking tech, right? And those two can be mapped to each other if you just give them something to communicate around, give them goals that are common. And that's why we're so focused on outcomes and customer values. Because once you start to tell them, okay, you know what, take everything you're talking about and map it to these six values. And now Mr. Marketing, you do, do the same thing. And then we're gonna get back together again and see how we align, right, priority wise. Are we aligning to the right things? Are we actually lining these things up in a way that makes sense? So now we're sort of building an interface for the two groups that can lock together like Legos, you know, that's the same. We're ta they're talking the same language now, instead of one person or one group using a different taxonomy and another group using another, you're now speaking one common language, which is customer success and outcomes based management. And once you get your people all focused on those outcomes, it's a very difficult for a lot of people who, if you think about HR and corporate America today, what does it focus on? It focuses on mostly on personal development, personal growth, your goals, your goals, your goals. Um, some of the more creative ones are now focusing on, you know, driving those goals, which, you know, they, a lot of people like to use smart goals. I don't consider them very smart, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't do that. Uh, because I think, again, it's more inwardly focused versus outwardly focused. There's no C in smart, right? Which is customer, right? right. There's no O, which is, you know, the outcomes that you're looking for. 
And uh, so that's kind of what we're, what we do, which is totally, I mean, it's not hard. We're not geniuses. We're just very opinionated. <laughs> when, we <laughs> that's come a good in, thing. when we come in, we say, this is what we want to do. And if you're not, if you know, if you can't get on board with this plan, then, you know, we're happy to leave because you're not going to succeed the way you're doing it now. You're not succeeding. So we can help you if you just get on board here. I mean, it has to be tough too, because they're, if they're bringing you in, you know, if they're failing, so now yes. that like, all eyes are on you to turn it around. And if for some reason doesn't turn around, you know, it's like, quote unquote, your fault. But I always have a, a saying that you can't fix shed products or shed services. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's true. I mean, listen, if you have a bad product, I don't care how much marketing you do. You know, it's I mean, you can spend tons of money, but the 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 chances of being successful, I, I don't know. You tell me, what do you think on that end when you when you come across something like that? Yeah, I mean, if the product is truly bad, so it doesn't fit the market you're going after, then really, unless you can, unless you have the self awareness as an organization or as a small company to take the advice and and relook and look back at yourself, because typically for me, a bad product is a result of total lack of self awareness. You're not willing to look in the mirror and say, "Are we really delivering what we promise?" Right? Um, and so those companies, they have two problems. One is they don't understand their customer and two, they don't understand themselves, which is really bad. So right. you, if they're not willing to fix the I don't, understanding myself problem, then you're never going to fix the understanding the customer problem because they don't care enough. The, the, uh, it comes down to what you said in the beginning. If you're passionate enough to care o about what you're doing and how you're doing it and who you're serving, and then this all fixes itself because you would not allow the divergence to occur. Right. You would be so focused on getting it right um, that you wouldn't be afraid to talk to the customer. You wouldn't be afraid to understand, oh, we made a mistake. You wouldn't be afraid of those answers. Um, the problem is a lot of people, especially if they don't own the company or they just work for it, will tend to yes people to death and end up with a company with, when we get the call, which is uh, uh, typically when things are so bad that. When, what you say is, you know, people look at us and say, oh, it failed because of you. That never happens because they're already failing. Uh, what they what they tend what we tend to deal with a lot is fear because they figure if we're coming in uh, to help turn the place around, that there's going to be, you know, radical change or some other thing that might impact them, which we which we ultimately try never to do. We try to save every job we can. But but that's you know, it's a long way around getting to if your product sucks, <laughs> you <laughs> do not understand your customer and you don't understand yourself. It's a twofold problem. It's not one, right? It's two. Now, since now that we're moving, I mean, when you started, uh, you started in the late eighties where you, you, you've been part of the computer revolution, the PC revolution and all that. Uh, obviously automation is becoming a huge thing. You see companies like Amazon, which, I mean, I've never been in a warehouse, but obviously I've seen videos and stuff like that. And we know, I mean, I know, how automated it is with you know the the picking robots and all that stuff um what do you think it's gonna it's coming in the next 10 years as, as far as like uh automation wise because we know everybody is it's not quite there yet for everyone but i personally think there's gonna be a shift with a certain demographic uh unless they're retrained uh, to learn you know how to deal with, with how to put I, i'm trying to figure out how to how to put it there's going to be a generation that's not going to be able to adapt to the technology just because at some point they just stop paying attention to technology, if that makes sense. Mm. Like, you know, I make fun of my parents. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, come on, guys. You know how to attach a PDF. I showed you this a million times. Yeah. Uh, you know, my dad, he doesn't have to do any of that, so it doesn't matter. But but it's it's quite scary because it makes you think, I mean, we have cars that are pretty much, you know, driving themselves, Tesla, you know, we, we have uh, startups that are have semis that travel the whole country on their own. Um, so it, it, what do you think it's coming in the next 10 years? What kind of shift do you see or, or, or you think it's going to happen in the 10 years when it comes with automation, whether it's on the inside and the outside, logistically wise? Well, I think you're dead on about retraining. I think one of the big problems that this uh, economy has is it tends to leave large groups of people behind without the proper education or skill sets to adapt. Uh, I think a lot of what we're seeing today um, with, um, again, inherent fear about what's happening with the tech and automation and robotics and robotic process automation and all of these you know, elements that are coming in the future, 
you know, yes, they're making businesses more efficient so that they can deliver value um, in profits and margins to their shareholders or, or, or stakeholders, I should say, regardless of being public or private. The people who are being displaced are not being uh, trained to take up the new jobs, right? I mean, it's not that difficult to train someone uh, to move from, you know, maybe working in a warehouse, which is now going to maybe fully automated to working in a customer service center. Right. The issue is you've got to take make the effort to take that training and make it happen. Because what I will say is with all the AI that's coming in, and I'm not a big fan of the term AI, because uh, I don't think there's much intelligence in the artificial world right now. It's very it gets much thrown predictive. way around yeah. way too much. Yeah. And AI, a yeah. lot of it is pretty dumb. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but it's, it's all like, dumb. It's it's, it's, all it's dumb. like yeah, it's a cat. It's a catchy word. Hey, it's AI driven. You know. Yeah. So so I think that you know until AI becomes truly intelligent, which is going to take quite some time. Um, you know, there's a lot of these roles because as we become more um, comfortable, particularly after the pandemic, a whole generation or generations of people who would not typically look at online as their primary method of interacting with the world are now using online to interact with the world, whether that's buying Zoom conferences, whatever tool you might be using. Uh, there's a lot of people who would never would have considered doing that prior to um, the pandemic. And so I think a lot of them were forced into learning it, uh, but a lot of those roles um, will shift and, and the training is critical. As far as what I see coming, yeah, I think that you hit it right on the head. I think that uh, the last mile is going to be automated within the next 10 years, meaning, you know, from the warehouse to your door right now is not automated, right? There's still a person that's driving that vehicle, that's picking, that's dropping that item. For example, in my neighborhood, uh, we have Amazon Key. So, you know, they can even walk into our homes and drop the packages right on the in the garage. And right. it's all automated, right? As soon as they get there, the garage door opens, they put the packages in, they say it's done, the garage door closes, it takes a picture. Uh, I get a text on my phone that says, your package has been delivered. It shows me the face of the guy. I mean, everything is going to be <laughs> um, So the next thing will be just a drone that'll do the same thing, right? It'll just, right. you know, it'll come up, the drone will come out of the back of the truck, it'll, do, it'll replace that. So how do we make sure those people don't get left behind? And if we don't start planning for that now, um, then 10 years from now, we're going to have a whole nother situation with a whole nother set of people uh, that feel like they were left behind again because, you know, they were promised um, a job and then they did that job and they did it well. Um, and the company benefited from that. And now, you know, they're, they're, um, I hate to use the word obsolete for people, but then they become, yeah. you know, not part of the equation. It's a very sad cycle that keeps repeating itself since the industrial revolution. Yeah, and no, we just don't seem to learn, right? We don't yeah. seem to learn from from that. And the reason I brought it up is because uh, obviously, uh, you know, it, there's it in every revolution. There's new jobs created. So all this AI, it's going to create new jobs. We just don't even know what those jobs are. My job didn't exist ten years ago. <laughs> you know, eleven yeah. years ago. It just, you know, I just fell into it. I guess. Uh, so. You know, you you're gonna have jobs that are gonna be that are gonna come out of all of this. So the reason why I brought it up is like, so you know, a company like Real Realware, when you guys start putting all these automated systems and stuff like that, that's something else you got to keep in mind too. Like, how can we, you know, reassign all these, you know, this the the force for the company without having to cut jobs and stuff like that? It's it's something that you guys will try to solve. Absolutely, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, we look for all opportunities for retraining. We're always looking to save as many as we can because if you're coming into a growing business, it's a different problem than if you're coming into a business that's declining or in trouble. Um, you have totally different issues in the two businesses. And and typically in a business that's growing, we're not dealing with the, the human resources issues. We're not dealing with those ca human capital issues. But when we're dealing with a, hu with a business that's in decline or that's in distress, even worse, human capital is is a problem in many cases and in some cases it's the reason why the business is in distress right so you have to kind of make sure you're you're judging you're you're building your judgments and your plans uh based on what again the customer outcomes and the business outcomes that you're attempting uh and then mapping that back to what i call a gap analysis but for the human capital side do we have all the skill sets that we need in all the right places in order to turn the ship around um, and it's, uh, and, and if we don't, can we train it? So the first question is, can we train it? Um, if we can train it, then how long will that take? What's the cost? If we can't train it, can we augment? If we can augment, then how much, you know, so there's all these decisions that you have to make, or do we have to hire new because the skill set will take too long to train? You know, those are really the three options you have when you're dealing with a human capital gap. 
Um, and that gap can be, and, and, and honestly, I will tell you this, in the last five years or so, the majority of that gap has not been in the middle management to the customer, right? Really? It's typically been in middle management to the sea level. <laughs> or the Re cap really? Exists. I would have never guessed that. Uh, because they're the ones not seeing the issues and they're the ones not communicating clearly so that the entire rest of the organism, the organization can execute effectively. That's right? interesting. If you're, if you're the CEO or you're the head of marketing, let's say, and you think uh, because the CEO or the head of strategy hasn't been clear about what the issues are, where they want to go, what the messaging is, and all these other things, and you're going down a certain path and you're communicating something to um, your team that's not in alignment with what the CTO is commuting to his team and what the COO is, is to her team. Now you've got, again, this whole thing comes back to communication and understanding and aligning everyone around a subset of goals that are customer driven. And that comes from the top. If there's a communication problem in a business, 99% of the time, it's because the top is not communicating clearly and transparently to the rest of the team. It's like playing a game of telephone too. It gets lost down the Absolutely. line. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Sure. If the CEO isn't going down to the, to the, to the teams and having meetings with them. I mean, I get this at a certain size, you can't do this, but then it becomes a leadership team. Then it becomes a, the broader leadership team. You know, you have to continue to communicate on a regular basis, transparently and consistently to ensure that that communication is embedded in everyone's thought process, that they understand why they're doing what they're doing. So yeah, I, I'm always, you know, when I hear about these problems and I get a call from a board member or an advisor or a, or an investor, and they tell me this company, you need to get in there. I need you to help me fix it. I start asking them questions about who's running it, who's the leadership team, what's their style, where are they from, you know, how long have they been there? I don't ask about how many customer service people do you have, how many warehouse folks do you have, because that's irrelevant. They're just executing the vision that was put in front of them. Hopefully, it's actually the vision that they expected to be executing, right? Yeah. And you find that the further you are away from the source, the, the, the less likely it is the information is actually clear. And that's what we help and try to get understood. So let me ask you something, uh, since you, you guys, when you guys are doing, you know, going in there with failing companies and I'm sure you get access to all the numbers, profit and loss, and you see everybody's salary and, and bonuses and all that good stuff. Cause sometimes, you know, I'm watching the news or, a, <clears throat> or reading an article or whatever. And then I see companies like, you know, uh, Toys R Us, GameStop, you know, it's like, and I'm looking at them, I'm like. Toys R Us is such a valuable IP. I grew up with Toys R Us. I grew yeah. up going with Toys R Us. Like, <laughs> you're gonna tell me no one in that company saw e-commerce coming from miles away? Where like, and again, I'm just saying this without even knowing what went inside. But my first thought would be, all right, they own a lot of real estate. I will probably sell all that real estate, lease it out, keep like the flagship stores in like New York, Miami, California, you know, those places. And then just move everything online. I, I mean, that's my first thought. And then, and then you see a company like Toys R Us going out of business. Like, what do you think happens? They're just complete disconnect. And then, you know, because the people at the top, they're just so out of the loop. Uh, same with GameStop. I mean, you know, GameStop is crazy right now. But uh, the, the <laughs> CEO of, uh, what is it, Chewy? He took over. So mm -hmm. he'll turn yeah. it around, I'm sure. But what do you think happens there? Like a company like Toys R Us, where it's been around for uh, Sears, for that matter, you know? Sears, I mean, from what you've seen, what, what, do, what do you think happens there? Yeah, I mean, I think they just didn't believe, right? They thought that they were so entrenched that they could never be displaced. I mean, look at look at what they did. If you look at, you know, back in the day, because this is when I was building a lot of large e-com sites, they handed the keys to Amazon. I mean, <laughs> if you can believe that, I mean, they basically, they didn't believe that Amazon could take, take them out. And Amazon took them out. In the end, right. that's what happened, right? And so if you look at the, they, they could, if they had taken a modern approach to their, to their, they could have had an online presence themselves. They could have used their stores for pickup and delivery. They could have been innovators. Instead, they sat back behind sandbags and said, oh, we're going to be okay. Don't worry. We're going to be okay. We're too big to fail. Classic, right? Abs look at IBM. IBM almost failed. If they hadn't turned their entire internal culture around, they would have been gone too. Yeah. Um, if you look at Microsoft, Microsoft, um, 10 years, 10, 15 years ago was not in a good place, right? It was stagnating. So big, the big companies tend, uh, because the leadership is so there's two things. Again, there's fear. I don't want to mess this up. It's a big company. I'm going to stick to incremental changes. So any kind of disruptive thing that occurs, they have a hard time adjusting to it. Um, 
but you know, Barnes and Noble's still here, right? They yeah. adjusted, right? They used their stores as they used what they had as an advantage instead of making it instead of entrenching themselves in the old ways, they used what they had as an advantage. Walmart is competing, you know, Target is competing. These stores, these companies are growing. They're growing online and they're growing their retail presence. That's why Amazon is opening stores. Yeah, I mean, Amazon, <laughs> Amazon is a unicorn that quote unquote, no one saw coming like regular people because it's like, dude, they have all the data. They know every single product that sells. And then people are surprised. Well, Amazon took the best seller and made their own. Wow, really? Are you that surprised? <laughs> you know, when I, <laughs> I have clients that are like, you know, we, we really want to move on to Amazon. And I go, why? Because we want to sell more. I go, great. You know that when that happens, you lose all that data. You don't even get the list of emails. So that right there, it's it could cost you millions of dollars down the road. And people don't realize that. That's Plus, right. Amazon can turn around and just copy your product and slap their name on it. I mean, if they really wanted to, I'm sure they can go out of the way and find it. But you know, why take that risk when you don't have to? But it's it's a it's a 50-50 type of deal, you know. It's a you want to be there, but you don't, depending on what the product is. But yeah. Um, so, uh, we're running, we're about to run out of time, but so for people that are listening right now, a lot of the people that are, that are watching this or listening right now, they're at that point where they're pivoting from, uh, scaling their businesses. You know, a lot of them, I talked to a lot of them. So a lot of them are in that place where they're, they're, they're getting out of the garage, moving into a warehouse type of deal. And they kind of scared because they never hired people. They don't know what, you know, I mean, they know the basics, like, you know, I got to set up shipping and all that stuff. What type of recommendation? can you make to those people that are like right on the edge where they have enough money saved up? Like what, what's the perfect time to make that decision? Like, because I've seen people do it too early and then they, you know, they overhead kills them. Right. So at what time, at what point should be, they should they be thinking about making that decision and what do you recommend to have in place uh, once they move in to avoid any like huge headaches, like maybe something to do with shipping, logistics, uh, inventory, like, from you know what you've seen out there, um, so the number one, um, the number one thing that I tell young entrepreneurs, um, not young in age, but young in their entrepreneur life sure. cycle, know your numbers, know your numbers inside and out, right? Know your costs, know your margins, know all of your physical world numbers. Of course, know all your online numbers, LTV, at conversion rate, etc. But understand the metrics the business has in order for it to run profitably. And if you're running it profitably, um, the next thing you need to understand is what do you really want? Are you looking for a lifestyle business? So do you want to just run it and you want to go and still play golf on the weekends and you don't want it to take over your life? Or are you looking for something to big grow something and then exit at some point, right? That's a big decision maker because if you're looking for a lifestyle business and you have the lifestyle you want, then why are you growing? You can grow, grow organically, don't go crazy. Don't don't overburden yourself and just stick with what you have. Don't the grass is never greener on the other side, period. Right. It's more work. It's more time. It's more headache. But of course, you hopefully will make, you know, more money as well. Right. So yeah. define success. That's when I say, what do you want? Define success is success being, you know, in, financially independent or is set success being able to you know, fly around the world whenever you want private, you know, decide. <laughs> right, right. right. What are the so, two? Do I want to fly private or do I just hang out at home? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Decide, decide that before you start going into bigger, more adding more expenses, but know your numbers, decide what success means to you, not what's to your wife or your dad or your mom or your girlfriend or your boyfriend, what it means to you, right? What does success mean to the person who's sweating in the business every day? And then as you start to go into physically growing the business, make sure you have your processes organized, even if it's just you by yourself, so that when you bring on person number two, you already have a process you can hand to them or part of a process you can hand to them, and they'll understand how to execute that. So if you don't take the time to document or write up or organize in a way that someone else can do it, then you're not ready to grow. You're not ready I to do add video, employee so number two. I have videos right. and then I have a transcript that's redone. So it's in exactly. video and paper. Yeah, I learned that's that one exactly. a time ago. Yeah. And then as far as physical assets and renting and logistics and systems and, you know, just do what you need. Don't get sucked into um, more than you need. The Cybertron 5000. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't, don't buy those 57 <laughs> plugins that for fun, right? You don't need them all. <laughs> right. And then finally, when you get to the next step, if you're tired of spending, you know, so much of your income, 
handing it over to these SaaS companies, then give us a call because we'll certainly save you a ton of money. Um, and, and you'll be much happier with less revenue because you'll be making more money. Exactly. Reach out to Realware, man. <laughs> Listen, Ali, thank you so much for coming on, man. This went by super fast. Um, obviously, you guys, uh, if you if you need somebody like Realware to come in and uh, help your business or grow your business, taking it to the next le level, go to uh, realware.com. And uh, Ali, where, where else can people find you? Uh, on LinkedIn, uh, it's uh, Ali Devachi. Just I think I'm only the only one. On Twitter, it's uh, A Devachi, at A Devachi. And on Facebook, it's Realware US. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ali. I really appreciate it. And uh, till next time, thank you. Thanks very much. I appreciated it. Take care.